Uh, thank you for coming along to uh, listen to what I'm going to say about uh, lithium-ion batteries. So I guess a lot of people uh, in the uh, news, everyone is seeing lithium-ion for new applications, energy storage, uh, as well as mobile phones and things like that. So far, they're not really uh, making a big inroad into data center applications. Um, probably, we don't see it changing too quickly. Um, but there are some interesting parts of the data center and UPS applications which we think could benefit from lithium ion. And um, I'd like to take you through some of the thinking behind that and uh, share some of those ideas. So, uh, uh, just a little bit of background. So, UASA or GS UASA, uh, Japanese based company. So, we're uh, about 100 years old now in battery manufacturing experience. Um, during that time, I think we fitted the first. Um, electric vehicle in Japan was uh, fitted with a GSU battery and we also fitted the first commercial EV with lithium-ion back in 2011 which was the uh, iMove. Um, in between then we spent most of our time making lead-acid batteries um, so which makes us sort of number two in the world um, for that centered on Asia but we do have uh, plants around the world in manufacturing and sales in Europe, America but we're a lot focused in Asia. Most of these are making lead-acid batteries, um, but over the last uh, 20 years, uh, GSU Astra has been um, developing the lithium-ion for industrial applications. So not going in your mobile phones, we're not making the small things for these, or laptops and so forth, but more for industrial applications. Initially, very high uh, costs involved, so it had to be things like satellites, um, uh, submersibles, so research equipment, things like that. But as the prices have come down, then uh, new applications have become possible. And uh, the big push, obviously, has been the electric vehicle market. And um, most of the products we're seeing now has been uh, the impetus and the cost down has been by allowing electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids, um, pure hybrid vehicles. And uh, so we've been following that market, or, or leading that market in many ways. As a result, we've produced this five plants in Japan where we're producing the lithium-ion cells um, for uh, vehicles, but also for industrial applications more and more as the price is becoming more attractive. The, uh, the basic cell structure we have gone for is a, um, so it's not a pouch cell or a cylindrical cell, there's various different architectures, but to give the right robustness and the um, uh, good packaging density and safety. We've uh, gone for a metal uh, container, prismatic metal container, um, with uh, multiple connection points. Uh, we're connecting at either end of the pack, so you get a uniform current flow throughout the, uh, the cell grouping, which allows us to get um, very uniform charging and discharging, high rate charging and discharging, and uh, really focusing on the, uh, the high rate and high cyclability. Um, again, because we are uh, primarily we were looking at electric vehicles. Moving on for more on the industrial uh, side of things and, and UPS, then uh, this gives some examples of the performance of modules. So we've moved away from uh, supplying cells on their own um, because we find that people are, uh, with a lithium ion battery, you have to integrate it with some sort of electronics to be monitoring the voltages, temperatures, doing the balancing of the cell state of charge um, actively with um, resistors and switches because it's not like lead acid where you can balance state of charge by just by float charging a system. So it's a bit more complicated um, and as a result we, pack, we think it's best to package all of that into a module so we will supply the module. Um, Obviously, uh, so sorry, I should have just uh, just gone through to show that different modules you've got different capacities, but then also different uh, power performances for charge and discharge. And so some of the small, the five amp per hour cells that we have over there, they, they can be charging and discharging at up to 50 C, so around uh, uh, high 40s, uh, 200 amp charge and discharge uh, on a five amp per hour battery is. Um, yeah, uh, extremely uh, high power performance. That power performance is, um, or the, if you like, the independence between power and energy is uh, highlighted in this slide 
where the, uh, the pink line shows that with a lead acid battery, this is a 100 amp per hour battery, for instance, at the 10 or 8 of discharge. Um, so you get 10 amps for 10 hours, it's 100 amp per hours. By the time you're discharging it over a period of um, 30 minutes, then you only got about half of that amp per hours. So if you discharge for um, uh, 100 amps, it will give you that 100 amps over 30 minutes, which is 50 amp per hours. So you've lost half the available capacity. With the lithium ion battery, you can maintain that uh, output uh, across almost the, uh, the entire range of power. So even if you are discharging it at um, three or four C rates, um, you're still getting well over 95% of the available amp per hour capacity. So key differences between the, um, is this idea of high power, uh, especially for the, uh, the cells and products we're making, is, uh, is a key difference with lead acid, which is probably the incumbent on the UPS market. Um, just to emphasize that, showing some, some results from, uh, this is like a demonstration cabinet that we, uh, um, we can take around to customers who, who might want to, uh, to see how lithium ion works so they can kick the wheels as it were and, uh, and try, try the uh, system for themselves. Um, so this is a cabinet um, just over a meter wide, 400 meters, uh, millimeters deep, and uh, multiple up to 20 modules. So you're working up to six, uh, 600 volts that can discharge it up to 600 amps. So um, you're talking about 230 kilowatts over a, a one minute discharge in, in a relatively very small cabinet. Um, and the max power for a few, for 10, 15 seconds could be something like 300 kilowatts in that power, in that footprint. Um, I won't go too much in that, that's just a circuit diagram which you won't see anyway, so I'll skip over that. This is sharing some results of how the batteries are actually discharging. Um, so this is the time along the bottom. So this was a uh, 22 kilowatt, so a relatively lower rate discharge. And so you could take 22 kilowatts for just uh, about 24 minutes. And um, you can see that the, the blue lines, so this was a constant power discharge. So as the voltage just tapered away quite normally, this could be a, almost could be a lead acid battery um, discharge performance, uh, except that you haven't got the, the coup de vue, the, the, the dip and then recovery that you often see in the voltage for a lead acid battery. That doesn't occur with lithium ion, which is very useful at high rates again, because sometimes it can, with lead acid, that, that initial voltage dip can cause things to trip out in, in fractions of a second, which is a big problem in very high power. Lithium ion doesn't have that uh, characteristic. So it's a nice gentle drop off, nothing. Uh, uh, nothing exciting. Take that up to 150 kilowatts um, in the cabinet. So now you're getting on to just under three minutes of discharge, but still looking pretty much the same, tapering off in voltage. Um, <coughs> current increases to maintain constant power. So, um, so it behaves in a very predictable and easily uh, understandable fashion. This, uh, this slide here is, is showing um, this relationship then between energy and power, available energy and the power that you want to discharge and, and showing, filling in a few more points between the 22 kilowatt example I showed you and the 151 kilowatt example. So that's power discharge rate or power along the bottom and up the other side is either the autonomy period, how long it lasted at those powers or the energy output in that, um, in that period. Um, so the blue line is autonomy, which sort of uh, tapers down. It's not a linear relationship, but if you look at the energy available um, from that battery, uh, that forms the red line. What we see is a very predictable um, relationship between the amount of energy you can get from the battery and the power rating at which you discharge it. So it's a nice straight line. You can fit a curve to it, and it's very predictable uh, in its performance. You couldn't say that for lead acid, the red line would be tapering away and it, each module would be different. Um, so it's a very um, predictable, reliable form of, uh, of use. This, um, moving on from the, um, uh, into a more uh, commercial uh, type situation, this is uh, similar to the, um, so instead of putting it into the uh, demonstration module, this is what we're producing for commercial 19-inch racks. You put the modules inside, 
join them in series, uh, parallel if necessary. And then um, you have a LIBM controller, which is the battery management system sitting at the top. This is looking at all the VAT data. As long as it's happy, you just use the battery. You've got a positive and negative terminal on the circuit breaker at the top. And uh, as long as the management system is happy, you just use it like you would a lead acid battery with two terminals or center tap if you want, whatever. Um, but the circuit breaker is, is also controlled from the LIBM, the battery manager. And if it decides that there's something that it doesn't like, really doesn't like about the system, then it would just open the circuit breaker and, uh, and isolate the system. And at the most basic level, you can use it like that. Um, but because it's got a very um, uh, detailed battery monitoring system inside, uh, included in the price, uh, then you can that squirt it out over CAN bus or RS485, uh, whatever you want. And that can talk with your power monitoring equipment, power management equipment, the UPS or, or whatever. So you've got a lot of control functions available to you if you want to use it. Just depends how, how complex you want to make your system. So how does that get to comparison with other high power uh, options that you have um, for UPS or storage units? Um, so these are the, the main types that uh, you can just pick these up from uh, commercial applications. VRLA over on the, uh, the far left uh, for 50 kilowatt, that, that set of batteries had 50 kilowatts, a footprint of about 1,500 wide, uh, 700 millimeters deep. A flywheel, this is a 100 kilowatt flywheel, footprint 800 by 800 millimeters. Um, super capacitor, that was a 12 kilowatt off the shelf thing with foot 400 by 800. Fairly low, they could be taken higher, but that's, that's something which is on the market. And then the, the lithium ion cabinet, which I've just described, so that's 300 kilowatts you can take for that, and you've got 600 by 800. So, pretty fantastic uh, energy den density, or power density, sorry, this is talking about power, not energy. So using those four uh, examples, I've put together some uh, uh, explanations of, uh, or comparisons, if you like, um, for this is the first slide is for the mass of the energy storage system. Um, I've used lead acid VRLA as the um, uh, um, point one, no, so the reference point uh, at 30 seconds. So uh, on the left hand side, we're saying at 30 seconds um, you would get uh, the, the mass per uh, unit of uh, power would be one. And at 30 seconds, the other uh, technologies, the supercapacitors, beat it, and lithium ion also beats it significantly. So mass um, for high power lithium ion is, is the way to go. With the supercaps or flywheels, you've got the blue line, which ramps up very rapidly, because both of those are high power but low energy density uh, technologies. Whereas the lithium ion maintains that uh, high energy density against high power as well over the whole range. So it's always up to 10 times better than the energy density for lead acid. So if you're, you've got a, a weight limitation in your UPS room or your battery room, then lithium iron could solve a lot of problems if you don't want to move to another building, um, but you want to fit in some more power or more energy. So that's the mass comparison. If you look at the volumes comparison as well, it's not such a stark difference in volume terms, but still you're looking down at that 30 seconds area of two or three times, uh, up to four times less volume occupied by a lithium ion uh, compared with lead acid or compared with um, uh, super caps in, in this case. So there is a volume saving as well. And because compared with lead acid, because of the weight, you can't go to very high racks. You know, you, you can't, not really going much above that level. Whereas lithium ion, you can easily go much higher with still maintaining a good floor loading. Um, so that means the footprint can be very significantly improved. So big difference in volume comparison as well. Um, but now we come to the, uh, the nitty gritty, the cost comparison. But what we see here, again, we're using one as the reference point at 30 seconds autonomy. 
and uh, lead acid. This is where it's the incumbent, and uh, there's good reasons for that, because we are talking, even out at 10 minutes, two or three times, the costs are coming down for lithium, but you're still talking two or three times. If you just want a straightforward 10 minute backup, not use it, very little, you know, once or twice a year when there's a blackout, then, um, or you want to test it for a period, lead acid, VRLA, is gonna be there for a long time to come. So we certainly don't see it as taking over for the traditional applications. Once you start to get down to the low, um, the very high power, very short autonomy though, then you're coming a lot closer. Uh, already we're getting close to parity in terms of cost. If you start to bring in other things like uh, cooling requirements, um, uh, recharging ability, if you want to use it many times, um, uh, as well as space, the floor, the savings on uh, uh, floor space, lost opportunity, instead of having a big battery and fewer servers, you can fit in a few more servers so you can generate more money, then the costs are blown out of the water then, so certainly you are, you'll be saving vast amounts of money if you can actually use that space more profitably uh, by fitting a lithium-ion battery. Um, but this is purely based on pay payment cost for the system. Um, so bringing that, that together, um, to, almost to sum up, I've put this table together looking at where are the pros and cons for these uh, different technologies and, and where are the, the, the application points. So if you look at the optimum run time, we would say the, uh, the VRLA, once you get out beyond five minutes, 10 minutes, then it's, it's the way to go. That, that's where you, because you, you're starting to get uh, good optimized performance out of that. Forget it if you're less than five minutes. They're just not designed to be giving those very high powers. The LIB, lithium ion, is probably good in the quarter of a minute to five, to two five minutes, and there's a crossover point somewhere. Whereas flywheels and supercaps, they're great if you just want a few seconds, uh, just enough to get the diesel generator working, but if you don't hit it first time, you're probably, you're lost. Whereas if you've got 30 seconds a minute, you've got two or three times to get the diesel generator running. Or you could be thinking about it and maybe not triggering you immediately. If you've got a super cap, you're going to have to hit the diesel generator button as soon as you lose power. At least with lithium ion, you've got the chance, five seconds to think about it before you start putting uh, actions in place. So uh, they're the sort of time scales, the power ranges which are available now. Um, lead acid, you know, you've got one web or power ranges, there's, there's multiple more than megawatt sizings out there at the moment. Lithium ion batteries, I think 20 megawatts is the biggest that we've fitted at the moment as a system. Flywheels, probably around a megawatt area. Super caps, I'm not aware of any more than about 100 kilowatts. Energy efficiency, just on float, not talking about round trip efficiency. They're all similar regions, but flywheels do waste more energy to keep them cool, keep the vacuum running, keep them spinning. Um, Lithium ion is, is definitely the highest because you're not charging at all. There's no float current. Once they're charged, they're charged. They're not taking any more energy after that. Temperature range, VRLA is pretty intolerant to temperature ranges if you want to get the optimum life. Uh, lithium ion is less so. It's much uh, more forgiven as the temperature goes up. So you don't need to run them at 20 degrees C. You know, the lifetimes are based on 25 to 30 degrees C normally, which can be the difference between compressor cooling and uh, natural air cooling. And then um, maintenance, low for the batteries, whereas flywheels have to replace the bearings every few years, high cost, very skilled work. And recharge times, minutes, seconds or minutes for flywheels, we're talking a few minutes to an hour or so for lead acid, for lithium ion, but days to get lithium ion lead acid back up. Okay. And just to summarize, so lithium ion, high rate performance permitted through the design, the ultra thin electrode structure. The cell structure is also optimized for power or energy density. The power cells are appropriate for UPS for a very short time. And the mass and volume savings are a significant benefit where your space is limited in your data center. And I think that was about it. Thank you. Yeah.